Kevin Spacey, Dustin Hoffman, Andrew Kreisberg, Brian Singer, the Weinstein brothers, and many others are now facing public scrutiny after being accused of crimes ranging from sexual harassment, sexual assault, to the rape of minors. Former Hollywood child stars are finally starting to speak out about the pedophilic pandemic that plagues Hollywood. Plenty of disturbing rumors are spreading about certain film studios acting as money launderers for child pornography and sadistic ritual abuse and trafficking of children. It's interesting what we find when we examine those at the very top of the Hollywood Hill. Here are five creepy facts that reveal the dark and sinister side of Steven Spielberg. Number five, pedophile Jones. Your favorite action hero is a pedophile. There's a transcription of a pre-production story meeting for the first Indiana Jones film that is very fascinating. The Raiders of the Lost Ark story meeting is between George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, and Lawrence Kasdan. And if you read it, you literally are witnessing the birth of Indiana Jones. Not only do you get to see how they work out the story and characters, you get to see things that were nuggets that were used in Temple of Doom. And there's even some shades of The Last Crusade. But the biggest highlight from the transcription is how they planned for Indiana Jones to have a pedophilic relationship with Marion. George Lucas, I was thinking that the old guy could have been his mentor. He could have known this little girl when she was just a kid, had an affair with her when she was 11. Lawrence Kasdan, and he was 42. George Lucas, he hasn't seen her in 12 years, now she's 22. It's a real strange relationship. Steven Spielberg, she had better be older than 22. George Lucas, he's 35 and he knew her 10 years ago, when he was 25 and she was only 12. It would be amusing to make her slightly young at the time. Steven Spielberg, and promiscuous, she came on to him. George Lucas, 15 is right on the edge. I know it's an outrageous idea, but it is interesting. Once she is 16 or 17, it's not interesting anymore. But if she was 15 and he was 25, and they actually had an affair the last time they met, and she was madly in love with him, and he dot dot dot, keeping this transcription in mind, this scene becomes a lot more sinister. I learned to hate you in the last 10 years. I never meant to hurt you. I was a child. I was in love. It was wrong and you knew it. You knew what you were doing. Now I do. This is my place. Get out. Mohan. Temigaru. Bolianu. I did what I did. You don't have to be happy about it, but maybe we can help each other out now. Indiana Jones had sexual intercourse with an 11 or 12 year old girl. It was justified by making it seem like the child was the promiscuous one who came onto Indiana Jones. And I quote, knew exactly what she was doing. Sounds like the defense Quentin Tarantino made to excuse Roman Polanski from raping a 13 year old girl. And this becomes extremely suspicious when you take into consideration the Polanski versus Samantha game case. On the 10th of March, 1977, Polanski, then aged 43, became embroiled in a sexual assault case involving a 13-year-old girl, Samantha Jane Gailey. A grand jury charged Polanski with five charges. One, rape by use of drugs. Two, perversion. Three, sodomy. Four, lewd and lascivious act upon a child under 14. Five, furnishing a controlled substance to a minor. This ultimately led to Polanski's guilty plea to a different charge of lawful sexual intercourse with a minor. This took place on the 10th of March, 1977, at the home of actor Jack Nicholson in the Mulholland area of Los Angeles. At the time the crime was committed, Nicholson was on a ski trip in Colorado. And just to make things a little weirder, here's a picture of Roman Polanski and Steven Spielberg on a little ski trip in 1977. If Spielberg was skiing buddies with Polanski, there is a good chance that he knew of his sexual perversions. And the inclusion of a pedophilic relationship in Indiana Jones was a nod to the disgraced director. When the film was adapted to a novel, Campbell Black created more of a backstory and used the actual age difference of the actors to determine that the Marion and Indy affair happened when she was 15 and Indy was 24. But even in that case, Indy still slept with a minor. Number four, 
Crispin Glover thinks Spielberg is a pedophile. Crispin Glover played Marty McFly's father in Back to the Future and was supposed to return for the sequel. However, he turned down the part and later sued Spielberg and won for using his likeness in the film. The reason why Crispin left is still unclear as the reason he gives have changed several times. From the story being morally corrupt to payment issues, no one can be really certain. However, Crispin Glover wrote an essay on his website, which has unfortunately been deleted, but can be found on archives on the Wayback Machine and is referenced through several articles. This essay suggests that Steven Spielberg likes little boys and Hollywood is covering up for him. What is it? By Crispin Helion Glover. Does Steven Spielberg hold the same values I wish upon myself? Does the mind of this grinning, bespectacled, baseball-capped man entirely reflect this culture? Is it true that in his waning years, Orson Welles asked Steven Spielberg for a small amount of money with which he could make a final film? Is it true Steven Spielberg refused? Is it true Steven Spielberg bought a sled used in Citizen Kane for an extremely large sum of money? Do Steven Spielberg's passions burn? Do passions burn in the man now imprisoned who wished to anally rape Steven Spielberg? Do our cultural mouthpieces confidently inform us that the wish to anally rape Steven Spielberg is a bad thought? Could anal rape of Steven Spielberg be simply the manifestation of a cultural mandate? Do you believe Steven Spielberg is an ideal guide and influence for our culture? What do Steven Spielberg's films question? Does Steven Spielberg focus much of his fantasy life on young people? Did he portray children wallowing in sewers filled with fecal matter in Schindler's List? Did he use children to finger paint an adult in Hook? Does he collect the illustrations of Norman Rockwell, such as the one showing a young boy in his underwear examined by a doctor? Are the inclinations of Steven Spielberg above suspicion by the media-fed culture? Was Steven Spielberg very friendly with Michael Jackson? Wasn't Michael Jackson supposed to play Peter Pan in Steven Spielberg's version of the story? Do Michael Jackson and Steven Spielberg share similar opinions about the sexuality of young boys? Number three, likes little boys. Cut! Awful! Who are you? The name's Ira Siegel. I directed the episode of Sybil where Christine Baranski sat on her balls. Point is, I can direct this thing. Look how many pockets are on his jacket. I think we should let him do it. I'll remake Mannequin on one condition. We make it Goonies. The Goonies? Why? Look at you four. Fat, nerdy, smart-mouthed, Asian. You guys are the Goonies. What's good enough for you is good enough for me. It's good enough. It's good enough for me. Crispin Glover isn't the only one who thinks that Steven Spielberg likes little boys. The Nambler Bulletin has a special column called Boys in the Media, tracking the doings of such Hollywood chickens as Macaulay Culkin, known affectionately in the bulletin as Mac, the self-described Ganymedian L. Martin, who wrote the Boys in the Media column, spoke by phone about Steven Spielberg and Hook. Chicken is a term originally coined by Nambla, the North American Man-Boy Lovers Association, that describes an underage male sexual partner, which was exposed by Addy Seidman in his documentary that exposes the group called Chicken Hook, Men Who Love Little Boys. Spielberg is known for his interest in young boys. Certainly, said Martin. A lot of the members have been talking about Hook, telling me how much they enjoyed it. Nambla spokesman Renato Carazza refused to confirm or deny Spielberg's possible membership in the Man-Boy Love Association. We do not divulge our membership roles. A lot of Spielberg's films focus on a man and boy relationship and Spielberg has been accused of trying to desensitize people to the notion of children having unusual close relationships with strange men or strange beings. For instance, E.T., Back to the Future, Jurassic Park, Ingenier Jones and the Temple of Doom, A.I., Temple of the Sun, The Adventures of Tintin, 
The Goonies, and even Hook. Michael Jackson was set to play Peter Pan in Spielberg's adaptation of the classic children's story, which was written by yet another alleged boy lover, James M. Barry. But Jackson was dropped and recast without explanation, and soon after, the pedophile allegations started coming in. During this time, it was rumored that Michael Jackson had refused to renew his contract with Sony Epic and was threatening them with a lawsuit. Corey Feldman also claims he went to the FBI to name a few very powerful Hollywood pedophiles, but the FBI refused to investigate and instead focused their attention on Michael Jackson. TriStar, a Sony company, was also the studio behind the production of Steven Spielberg's Hook. Steven Spielberg's adaptation replaced the forever young Peter Pan with an older man, yet again, sticking to his man-boy relationship formula. Spielberg's costume designer, Anthony Powell, who also worked with Roman Polanski, endows Hook's Lost Boys with a Benetton meets Oliver twist look tailor-made for the chicken hawk sensibility. Dance of the Warriors, a futuristic fantasy about a warrior cult of young boys who fight right-wing Christians for the privilege of having sex with aging boy lovers. Sports on its cover, a salt and pepper boy couple who almost precisely mirrored two of Spielberg's Lost Boys. The book appeared in the pedophilia section of gay bookstores just at the time that Hook was going into pre-production. Hook's emotional highlight, strangely absent from the shooting script's first revised draft, is the touchy-feely communion of the adult Peter Pan and the Lost Boys. We're treated to prolonged takes of the tykes touching and caressing Robin Williams' face and body. When the Lost Boys smear war paint on Williams' naked torso, the idol is reminiscent of a certain gay body painting video advertised in The Advocate that focuses on creative eroticism that expands and extends the beauty of foreplay. Even if we are reading a bit too deep into this, it's not hard to miss some of the rather odd tones and scenes from his movies. And he slashes at you with this. Six inch retractable claw, like a razor, on the middle toe. He doesn't bother to bite your jugular like a lion, say. No, no. He slashes at you here or here. Or maybe across the belly, spilling your intestines. The point is, you are alive when they start to eat you. So, you know, try to show a little respect. Especially his first movie, which is now the name of his own production studio, Amblin. In Amblin, a young man carrying a closely guarded guitar case befriends a free-spirited young woman while hitchhiking across the desert in Southern California en route to the Pacific coast. At the beach, the man frolics in the surf while the woman covertly inspects the content of his guitar case. A suit and tie, toothpaste, mouthwash, milk of magnesia, a roll of toilet paper, and a copy of Arthur C. Clarke's The City and the Stars. The woman smiles in bemusement, perhaps sensing all along that her companion was not the quintessential hippie that he appeared to be. She then leaves the beach without him. Doesn't sound that exciting, right? But after Sid Sheinberg, the then vice president of production for Universal Television saw the film, Spielberg was signed to a seven-year contract with Universal Television, making him the youngest director ever to get a long-term deal with a major studio. What exactly is so special about this 26-minute film with no dialogue? It's a movie about pretending to be normal while keeping your secret close-guarded. The reason why the girl left him on the beach is not because the guy wasn't a hippie. It was because he was gay, and the evidence is in his guitar case. Milk of Magnesia and The City and the Stars by Arthur C. Clarke. Let's take a look at the evidence, starting with The City and the Stars. Here's an analysis of the book from Purple Prose Archive. The City and the Stars reflects the experience of someone who feels very different to everyone else around them. I can see how it would have appealed to the disaffected adolescent in the 1950s. Alvin is not like anyone else on Earth. No one understands him, and he doesn't share their fears. He has to leave his supposed home to find his true home. I generally try to avoid making simplistic, autobiographical links between stories and their writers. But as I read, I did find myself wondering if Arthur C. Clarke might have been gay. So when I looked him up on Wikipedia, 
I was interested to find out that he almost certainly was. Something about Alvin's subject position reminded me of being a gay adolescent myself. That feeling of being different to everyone else. Wanting something they don't want. Not to mention his inability to relate to his girlfriend and his close bond with Hilvar. I did find this undertone quite interesting and wondered if it might have contributed to the sense of emotional distance in the novel. On a trip to Florida in 1953, Clark met and quickly married Marilyn Mayfield, a 22-year-old American divorcee with a young son. They separated permanently after six months, although the divorce was not finalized until 1964. The marriage was incompatible from the beginning, said Clark. Clark never remarried, but was close to a Sri Lankan man, Leslie Akanayaki, whom Clark called his only perfect friend of a lifetime. In the dedication to his novel, the Fountains of Paradise. Clark is buried with a kanayaki. In his biography of Stanley Kubrick, John Baxter cites Clark's homosexuality as a reason why he relocated, due to more tolerant laws with regard to homosexuality in Sri Lanka. In an interview in the July 1986 issue of Playboy magazine, when asked if he had a bisexual experience, Clark stated, of course, who hasn't? In his obituary, Clark's friend Kerry O'Quinn wrote, Yes, Arthur was gay. As Isaac Asimov once told me, I think he simply found he preferred men. Arthur didn't publicize his sexuality. That wasn't the focus of his life. But if asked, he was open and honest. What's even more disturbing is that Arthur C. Clarke has strong ties to Nambla and has been accused of being a pedophile by highly credible sources and despite condemning evidence, had never been charged. U.S. detectives who arrested leaders of Nambla 10 years ago say Clark was named by other pedophiles they quizzed during the FBI investigation. The perverts had set up children homes in Thailand as a front for their sick activities. One of its leaders was Jonathan Tampico, 48, a top nuclear scientist who worked with the American government. He served two and a half years in jail for molesting a boy of 12 and is now on the run with a multi-million dollar warrant on his head for further porn offenses. He told detectives he had stayed at Clark's home in Colombo and had swapped letters with the author. Another known pedophile, former church minister John Wakefield Cummings, 56, is serving a 24 years to life sentence after admitting to molesting 17 boys in his care. He told the police in Sacramento, California that Clark had been in contact at his Sri Lankan home by a pedophile who was on the run from American authorities. In a sworn statement made to an investigator for Sacramento's district attorney, Wakefield Cummings told how the pervert fled to Sri Lanka where he was able to contact the pedophile community through Clark. Detectives contacted a child welfare group to warn them about Clark's activities. A senior Sacramento detective said, we never had any reason to take action against Arthur C. Clark because he was outside our jurisdiction. But Clark's name did keep coming up. We were looking into members of the Boy Lovers Association who all seemed to know or be aware of him. He ended up connecting to a lot of people we were investigating. Tampico was one of those who said he went to Sri Lanka. I have seen letters between him and Arthur C. Clark. There was nothing overtly sexual in them, but they were clearly corresponding. He added, Cummings told us in the course of interviews that Arthur C. Clarke is a pedophile. He said Sri Lanka used to be a popular destination for pedophiles. But then the government changed and they were all thrown out. He said Clarke was one of the few that didn't expel because of his status. Ron O'Grady of ECPAT confirmed he had been warned about Clark by police in Sacramento. So now that we can assume that the character in Amblin is gay, the milk of magnesia starts to make a whole lot of sense. Milk of magnesia is a laxative that is often taken by gay men to clear their bowels before anal sex. Perhaps Spielberg was signaling to other Hollywood producers, letting them know exactly what he's up for and what he's into. How did 20-year-old Steven Spielberg get his $15,000 funding? An unknown man called Dennis Hoffman produced his film, and he's never produced again. Also, the movie title Amblin is nonsensical. It has no meaning. However, the name of the protagonist in Arthur C. Clarke's book is Alvin. The major difference in the name is MB. Could this stand for man-boy? In that case, man-boy love? I mean, Amblin and Nambla are very similar names. Or maybe it's just a shout out to the children of Hamblin. You know, 
the ones who were stolen by the Pied Piper. It is also interesting to note that Steven Spielberg was on the advisory board of the Boy Scouts of America, but decided to stop supporting them when they stood firm on the decision they would not accept gay people. I thought the Boy Scouts stood for equal opportunity, and I have consistently spoken out publicly and privately against intolerance and discrimination based on ethnic, religious, racial, and sexual orientation," Spielberg noted. Joey Robinson, a spokesman for the Boy Scouts Los Angeles Council, said he had not yet been informed that the filmmaker had departed his advisory role. He did, however, defend the council's right to set its membership policies. It's not discrimination, it's the right to set membership standards, Robinson said. Every group has its standards. The Girl Scouts have a rule that you have to be a girl. When asked how he felt about Spielberg's opposition to the group's policy excluding gays, Robinson said, This is America. Everybody has a right to voice their opinion, and we respect his right. The Boy Scouts begin accepting members at the young age of seven and on occasion, the Cub Scouts are included in senior scout events. In late 2017, the policy was revised and gay and transgender people are now allowed to join the Boy Scouts. Number 2. Child Stars and Protégés Steven Spielberg is known as the creator of stars. Not only does he cast people for his roles, but he also headhunts. He personally discovered Drew Barrymore, Christian Bale, Elden Ehrenreich, and many others. He has also worked with a plethora of child actors who have now risen to international stardom. However, a lot of the talents he has produced have all had issues growing up, if they ever grew up at all. Drew Barrymore first made her on-screen debut on Steven Spielberg's E.T. She developed a drinking and drug addiction at the age of 9 and was sent to rehab at the age of 13. Corey Feldman, who appeared in Gremlins at the age of seven and later in The Goonies, claimed that he and his friend Corey Haim were drugged and raped by one of the most powerful men in Hollywood. Corey Haim, although never featured in a Spielberg movie, was spotted on the set with Spielberg. Feldman claims that Haim was raped by an A-list actor, producer, and director. Corey Haim died in 2010 after a drug overdose. Elijah Wood was only eight when he appeared in Steven Spielberg's Back to the Future 2. He also claims that he was molested and raped as a child and that the most powerful men in Hollywood are pedophiles. Judith Barcy appeared in Spielberg's Jaws 2 and The Land That Time Forgot died at the age of 10 in an alleged murder-suicide. She was shot and set on fire. She was buried with her mother in an unmarked grave and her father's body disappeared. River Phoenix, who played young Indy in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, died of a cocaine and morphine overdose in Johnny Depp's nightclub in October of 1993. His younger sister Summer, who was only 14 at the time, and Hakim were there and contacted the authorities. Okay, calm down a little bit, okay? What's the address where you need us? It's Sunset and Larrabee. It's at the Viper Room. Okay, what's the address, sir? Do you know? What's the address of the f***ing club? Okay, sir. Sir, yes. calm down a little bit, okay? I'm sorry. It's That's my okay. brother. Please come here. It's Paul Lizzie. He's 23. Calm down, okay? If you can't calm down, get the phone to somebody else. No, there's no one else around. Okay. I'm fine. Now, I think he's dead volume or something. I don't know. Who's with him right now? Um, my sister, the people. Okay, can you talk to her from where you are? Oh, I got her. She's trying to give him mouth to mouth. Sir, calm down. Tell her not to give him mouth to mouth. Don't give him mouth to mouth. You only, you only give him mouth to mouth if he's not breathing. What's he doing? Just seems like he's sleeping right yeah, now. Yeah, just looks like he's sleeping. Okay. okay. That's very normal, okay? Yeah. That's very normal. Sometimes, if, in fact, sometimes they do actually go to sleep. If he goes into another seizure, okay, and sometimes they do that, mm -hmm. just let him have a seizure. Don't try and restrain him, all right? Well, what about putting my tip hand in his mouth? Do not put nothing in his mouth. Okay. Okay? He yeah. will not swallow his tongue. Okay. Believe me. Okay. You just let him go ahead and have a seizure. Paramedics okay. are on the way. They should be there. River and his younger brother and sisters were a part of a cult called the Children of God, a pseudo-Christian cult with ties to Nambla that participates in sexual and ritual abuse of children, pedophilia, and spouse swapping. When the Phoenix family were found to have ties with the cult, the mother immediately pulled her children from the cult and claimed she believed it was just an innocent Christian group. The cult is still active today under the name of The Family International. 
they encourage children to masturbate while thinking about Jesus. And finally, Heather O'Rourke. She was discovered in public by Steven Spielberg at the age of five and cast in a horror film, The Poltergeist. She died in 1988, the same year as Judith Barsi, at the age of 12, after she was misdiagnosed with the flu. But it was later reported that she died during surgery to repair an acute bowel obstruction, complicated by septic shock. This report was corroborated by the San Diego County Coroner's Office on February 3rd, two days after her death. Later reports changed the specific cause of death to cardiac arrest, caused by septic shock brought on by the intestinal stenosis. This takes us to the final creepy fact about Steven Spielberg. Number 1. Hollywood Whispers Heather's death at the time did not raise any alarms because it was misreported twice. And with so many contradictions in the case of her death, people started to question the original report. Many people now believe that Heather O'Rourke was abused and the autopsy reports could be proof that she was abused. Intestinal stenosis or bowel obstruction is often caused by child abuse. Here is just one of many reports in the US National Library of Medicine to prove it. We present the case of an anal sexual abuse involving a two-month-old boy who was admitted to the pediatric surgery unit of the University of Padua for low bowel obstruction. The infant had already been hospitalized for three days in a peripheral hospital and treated with daily rectal washouts for a fecaloma. Only after a careful interpretation of the plain abdominal radiograph, along with the performance of a rectoscopy and a laparotomy, a vegetable foreign body about 3 cm in diameter and 7 cm in length was discovered in the sigma. The morphology and dimensions of the foreign body, as well as its location, left no doubt about the etiology of the partial bowel obstruction, proving that it was clearly related to an anal sexual abuse. Heather O'Rourke might have died from having a large object inserted into her anus. And this is where things get weird. Mind you, the following article is unconfirmed and does not mention any names. However, this user, Ent Lawyer, was the same person who posted information about Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey way before it broke the news. The blind, titled A Long Time Coming, reads, when I started putting out feelers to former child actors who had worked on his movies, I was surprised how many people wanted to tell their stories about working for this permanent A-plus list director. They come from all different backgrounds and sexes. Most have never worked as adults as actors, but a couple continue to make an effort and a couple have succeeded. I started reaching out to them through an old friend, a friend who once had a large role in a hit movie for the director. A friend who until recently never told me about the dark side to filming a movie with this legend. One thing he said resonated with me and I asked each of the others the same question. Most responded in the affirmative. Some said they wish they could remember but it had been X number of years or others said they really didn't want to think about it too much because it triggered them. The query was whether the backstory of the character they were playing had molested. Their answer was yes. One actress who responded yes said, she was only in the first grade when she made the movie. It had a lot of young kids in the movie, although they were older than her. She remembers a cast bonding experience. All of the young actors and actresses were loaded onto a tour bus. Everyone was impressed because each seat on the bus had a DVD player waiting for them as a gift to take home. Back then, those things were expensive. The trip took about two hours from LA. There were served all kinds of kids food on the bus. She remembers the all you could eat candy. So they get off the bus and arrive at this huge ranch. Who was there to greet them with the director? This permanent A plus list singer. There were also other men there who she remembers hearing were studio executives. She doesn't know if they were. She does remember walking around this carnival, as she put it, and seeing the executives pairing off with a couple of the actors or one on one. She says they later told her that most were molested or groped. For her part, she says she was just repeatedly groped. There was a carousel ride and one man insisted on putting her on a different horse each time. 
and would lift her and grope her each time. She says she freaks out whenever she hears carousel music. My friend from so long ago says his experience differed slightly. Another actress who was a teenager when she made a huge movie for the director says that she wasn't given a ride on a tour bus, but instead was given a ride on a helicopter with her younger actor co-star. They ended up flying to that same ranch north of Los Angeles. When the helicopter landed, that permanent A-plus lister was waiting there with the director. Also, there was another actor from the movie who is probably B-list today. The child actor was sent off with a group of men to the carnival while she was followed by the much older B-list actor who asked sexual questions one after the other and excused himself multiple times. She assumes now that he was going off somewhere to pleasure himself and then come back after. It was hot that day and she remembers him drenched in sweat and just a pig in so many ways. She said she has talked to actors who didn't even get to act in the movie, directed by the director, but were still hired to help develop the backstory of the adult actors because they might use some flashback shots. All these actors added to the totals molested by the director and his friends. Every movie seemed to have any kind of reason they could use to find teen boys and girls that could be molested under the guise of developing their character. Was the A-list director Steven Spielberg? Was the LA Ranch Neverland? Was the A-list singer Michael Jackson? Was the movie Hook? Was the little girl Amber Scott, the youngest of the cast. Amber Scott never returned to acting after Hook. Michael Jackson was set to play Peter Pan in Spielberg's Hook. What happened? Steven Spielberg and Michael Jackson were very close friends during the production of Hook. The connections are there, and they are strong. But wait, it gets even darker. Yet another blind appeared on the same site, titled, Molesters Killed Her. Back in the mid-80s was peak child molesting time in Hollywood. There was no internet. There were very, very few mobile phones. Children came to the set where they were left alone by their parents. For the next eight hours, they were subject to every kind of horrible thing you can imagine. Drugs were commonplace. They were used to try and get the kids not to be so hysterical when being assaulted. Producers loved casting shows with kids and tweens. If someone pitched a show that involved a handful of tweens with a dozen tween extras per week, it would get a green light. Even if the show was going to suck and everyone knew it was going to suck, if they got the right pedo at the studio, he would say yes just to come for the casting and taping of the pilot. As sad as it is to say, there were a lot of parents who told their kids to go off with a nice man in the suit and do what he says. It was a sick, sick time. It was just past the mid-80s when a producer came up with the idea of a tween show that not only would feature a rotating cast of extras, but would make the studio a bunch of money because they would film quickly and not hire any adults. Further, the faster they filmed, the more time they would have to molest all the kids that would be hanging around. From the first day, it was the worst place on earth if you were a kid. The studio where the show was filmed also had several other shows being filmed there, most of which featured lots of children. Executives would drive over to Hollywood right before lunch and would stay at the studio for several hours each day. Anyway, on this particular show, there was a very special guest star. Still not a tween, but everyone knew who she was. Executives flocked to the studio that day to see her. She was first molested when she was five or six and had continued to be molested throughout her hit movies and also on previous shows. One of the stars of the show who spent her life bouncing in and out of rehab because of what she saw and who was actually nominated for awards from the show described the atmosphere that day. A bunch of fucking pigs. I had just turned 12 or 13. I was the same age as the actress coming in, maybe a little older. We had been shooting for months and I was old news. They knew I would do what they wanted, but they always wanted someone new. This was someone new and someone they all knew. They had it set up like a peep show almost. She had finished shooting that morning and they brought her out on a stage. The stage was used most of the time for a game show that was taped there. That game show is still on today. I can't watch it knowing what happened to her there. They brought her out. 
and the front four rows of this theater were filled with guys who were already rubbing themselves. This girl was wearing a bikini. The show took place around a beach just so they could make these girls wear next to nothing. They had her walk around under the lights. The lights were focused on her and she couldn't really see out to the audience. She was squinting. It must have been blinding for her. They had her walk back and forth. Then they had her start dancing. All of these guys were doing what another star at the same studio got busted for. This went on for about 20 minutes. Then three of the guys took her to a different area of the studio. The actress didn't see what happened, but 45 minutes later, one of those three guys came running out and needed a set medic. Apparently, they had inserted something inside the girl and things were bad. The medic came and the ambulance came. The parents of the girl were told some crappy story. That crap story ended up killing the girl because the parents believed the executives. Two weeks later, the show finished shooting six episodes all at once. Then everyone was sent on their way forever. No one wanted the kids around or any witnesses to what happened. Was the young victim Heather O'Rourke? Was the show she was guest starring on Rocky Road? Was it at Hollywood Studios Sunset Las Palmas? Is the girl who witnessed this Devon Odessa? Heather O'Rourke was discovered at the age of five by Steven Spielberg. She has been in several hit movies and became a bit of an icon as the girl in front of the TV on The Poltergeist. Her autopsy report states she suffered from bowel obstruction. She was an extra on the show Rocky Road, a show about some kids who inherit an ice cream shop at the beach. In 1997, when she was 11, she appeared in episode 22, season 3, which was filmed around April that same year. This show is filmed in Hollywood studio Sunset Las Palmas. Jeopardy and Rocky Road were both shot at the same studio. Devon Odessa starred in Rocky Road. She was nominated as Best Young Actress for her role in that show. She has been in and out of rehab multiple times. The third season of Rocky Road was the final season. There were 30 episodes in season three, which means they had to film the remaining eight to finish the contract as per The Blind. It all seems to add up. Is Steven Spielberg a member of Nambla? Does he like little boys? Is he a part of a child trafficking ring and are his nefarious activities being covered up? Maybe, maybe not. After making these connections, although he certainly looks sinister, there is no proof that he is the big bad guy in Hollywood and we will never know unless someone speaks out about it. But even though he may not be directly involved, I do think it is safe to assume that he has some knowledge of what is really going on in Hollywood. If there are child trafficking or sex rings in Hollywood, I am pretty certain he would know about them. Until more news breaks, it is very important that we keep asking questions and investigating because eventually the truth will come out.
Hey guys, I just want to use this opportunity to pimp out my Patreon. If you like my content and want to support me, you can do so by heading over to my Patreon page and making a pledge. Even the smallest amount helps, so you can pledge a dollar if you like. Or you can pledge a little more to unlock some other Patreon tiers. A $5 pledge will get you a special thanks in the credits. A $10 pledge will get you listed as a member of the crew. And those who pledge $20 will become producers and receive special perks. Thanks guys, and I hope you enjoyed the video.